Welcome everyone to Decision Intelligence for Complex Optimization, The Road Ahead. Our presenter today is Dr. Lorian Pratt, who actually changed the title of the webinar to say the future history of the universe in 30 minutes, and I think you'll get a kick out of that as we move through today's uh, presentation. I'm Margaret Johnson with Quantelli, and it's my pleasure to welcome you. Uh, Dr. Pratt, uh, just by way of a little history, is one of the co-founders of Quantelia. Uh, six years ago, she and Mark Zangari uh, discovered that there was a, a gaping hole in the way that we use information to make decisions. And leveraging her career as an analyst with Stratocast and Frost and & Sullivan, as well as time at Belcor and IBM, and her three dis uh, degrees in computer science, including a PhD in uh, from Rutgers University, um, Lorian and Mark and their teams uh, put together some of the things that you'll be seeing here today. So with that, uh, Lorian, go ahead and take it away. Thanks a lot, Margaret, and uh, at the risk of sounding too enthusiastic, this is the coolest thing in the whole world, and I'm really glad you guys are here, because this is just awesome. Um, thank goodness that we've made it past this scene where we come to a blank table and try to make difficult decisions. These days, we often have a huge amount of data. We have facts and evidence-based decision making. And the idea here is to be more objective and ultimately to be more effective because we're more objective. So psychologists and others have built beautiful data visualizations. And the basic idea here is to kind of reduce the friction, reduce the effort that it takes to get data and evidence and facts out of a computer or off of the paper and up into our heads, kind of that upload process from the data into our brains. And, and that's why we do visualization, is, is to make that as painless as possible. And, and again, we've seen huge success in this space. We see a number of companies out there that are experiencing the huge power of analytics and substantially improved use cases. Folks like uh, Google, who, who went and hired all my friends. Everybody in analytics, I think, has passed through Google at some point or the other. Uh, they use machine learning and deep learning and neural networks. These are all analytics technologies that are really the backbone of, of what Google does. Um, Amazon, uh, the book that you read somebody else might like, or the book that you might buy is one that uh, somebody like you likes, and so you might like this other book as well. Um, that kind of analysis is also uh, driven by very powerful analytics. Visa, of course, the entire uh, credit card industry um, as we know it today is again, has, has a, an analytics backbone. Uh, fraud as well as credit application analysis are all done by uh, computers, very powerful systems, running without uh, human intervention, making decisions about which, uh, you know, which cases might be fraudulent or, or which uh, credit application should be approved. So um, you know, this kind of goes hand in glove with that data idea we talked about earlier. This is you know, what's often quoted as a lot of the evidence for the power of data and then all kinds of analysis on top of that data that can drive a lot of success. But here's the really, really interesting part. This is big. I'm not trying to minimize this. But relative to its potential, it's pretty small. So there is this uncharted territory out there. And what I mean by that is that there are use cases. There are applications within businesses that could use more evidence-based or more fact-based management analysis. Um, and not just businesses, but uh, governments and other sorts of organization, or organizations. There are, there are these use cases out there that could use analytics, but don't today. And kind of in this halfway place is decision support, dashboards, business intelligence, visualization. All of these are kind of in that, that upload into the brain space. The, the idea is, you know, these kinds of decisions that these things support um, really need a human in the loop, but we also want to use some data. So what can we do to most conveniently get data at the right time to the right person into their heads so that they can make good uh, decisions? Um, and, and that's okay, but we could do tremendously better. And, and, and this is 
a multi-trillion dollar opportunity worldwide. I, this is nothing small. This is not just a, a wrinkle or, or something just marginally um, an improvement. There are huge opportunities to both make uh, more money and also to save money uh, by being better and, and running our businesses more objectively. And we'll do a very specific example of this um, in a little while. Uh, Margaret, I'm going to put you on the spot and, uh, and we'll see how, um, how we can do that. Um, now, I think it's important to me that it's not just dollars but human lives also that can be saved by making better medical decisions, better pharmaceutical decisions. So there are multiple bottom lines here, um, not, just, not just dollars, but also some factors that are very, very important. So I'm making a really big claim here, okay, that there's this trillion dollar opportunity if we look outside the typical analytics use cases within our organizations, uh, governments, nonprofits, and commercials. Just a little bit of validation, uh, Tony Calcina, the founder from Clarity, recently said that this is the holy grail of his industry, which is a part of telecom called OSS-BSS. He says, this is what we've been aiming for within, within the OSS-BSS part of telecom. It enables us to deliver the long-promised real-time business optimization. So I kind of like that. I, I like that we call that a holy grail. Uh, that sounds good. Okay, you know, trillions of dollars, holy grail. All right, let's get into the, the meat of this. How, how do we get there? How do we get this, this, uh, these extra use cases to be realized? Well, um, like browsers that help the internet to take off, really um, using, uh, understanding how people think visually can also help us in this decision-making space. And so this is really the core constraint on what we're doing. That uploading into the brain thing that we talked about earlier where you have all those charts and we want to get them into our heads more quickly, well, we're only going about part of the way, maybe halfway towards what we could do in terms of having computers help us. We're kind of on our own after we look at the data, after we look at the visualizations. Now we've got to make up our minds and invisibly, without any further help, just talking with other decision makers, um, we've got to, to take that data, combine it together, mix it up, and come up with some sort of a decision. And that's difficult, okay? So the real key here is the idea of understanding how we think and then making decisions naturally. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've talked in other webinars on our YouTube channel, you can read much more details about this, that one of the great kind of epiphanies at Quantelia is that every decision is made of just six building blocks. And I'm going to cough for a second, Margaret, if you want to say something. Excuse me, guys. <coughs> There, okay, I'm back. Let's see how that goes. So every decision is made of just six kinds of building blocks. And this is huge because it means that massive complexity gets reduced to, you know, really massive simplicity. If we structure our decisions in a highly visual way, we can uh, get something that's very, very difficult to understand into something that, for which people have a lot of intuition. And why is that good? It's because it reduces that cognitive friction. It gets us beyond just the task of loading up the data into our heads and then leaving us to do this decision model inside our heads. Instead, we're going to use the computer for what computers are good at, which is combining all these numbers and analyzing all the numbers in order to come up with some benefit. And as you've seen in the other webinars in this series, usually what we do is we start with the decision levers. Let's see, what price should we charge? What drug should we use? What uh, geographic region should we deploy that, that new medicine? All of those things that we have control over. And the idea is that we run a simulation, or at least we think clearly through a visual model, um, that, that helps us understand how those decision levers combine with the externals in our environment in order to produce outcomes. Okay, so this is, this is kind of review. If you've seen some of the other webinars, this should be familiar. But here's the cool part. We can run this backwards. We can use the computer to tell us what those decision levers can be. So we can move forwards and backwards. We can use the computer to give us an intuition of decision levers, and then we can push a button, and we can say, you know, if I want to achieve these particular goals, what decisions should I make? What price should I charge? 
uh, what country should I launch my product in, and, and other decisions that we might have available. And this is the key thing. Finally, now we have a way of representing a massive set of complex problems that haven't been easily representable, and so people just don't do it. I mean, there's great um, OR people and great statisticians out there who, who can take you know, lots of problems and, and formulate them, but they're just not used by the masses because it's so complex and because it's so mathematical. What we've got here is we've reduced that cognitive friction because this is such a simple way and such a universal way of thinking about decisions. So let's jump straight from the abstract down into the very specific. These are a couple of old laptops in our office here at Quantelia. And, and the question that we face is, what should our policy be? Let's imagine we have 1,000 users. And, and how often should we buy them a new laptop? Should we buy the laptop, uh, a new laptop every year to make sure that it doesn't break down? Um, or, or is that too expensive? Let's say we, we want to have you know, kind of a cost savings initiative. So there's a few different things we might do here. Margaret, if, if you wanted to save laptop money, what would you do? I mean, do you have any thoughts here? Let's, let's well, uh, kind of put sure. you on the spot, if you don't mind. Put me on the spot. You know, as uh, I've heard certainly the financial folks say, well, we can depreciate these over three years, so we should keep laptops for three years. I've heard technology-focused people say, I need a new laptop every year because technology changes so fast and I have to keep up. So I'm going to say that we probably should come with a blend there, and I'm thinking two years is probably about right. Okay, and, and, and should we get the, um, the expensive ones? Should, should we buy kind of super high-end, high-build quality laptops that tend to last longer? Or, or do you think we should get cheaper models and replace them more frequently and then save money that way? Well, having gone through some laptop pricing um, and done some of that analysis, I can say that over the course of two to three years, we can actually replace a cheap one a couple of times before we exceed the cost of the really expensive one. So I'm thinking that, you know, in the abstract, just thinking this through in my head, I'd be likely to say, let's figure out what percentage of our users can tolerate a laptop replacement and which ones can't. And I'm guessing that's probably about 30%. OK, so we'll say 30% high end and 70% low end. Now, why, are we, why in the world are we talking about laptops in an optimization webinar? What's going on here? Because um, this is a great, really simple way of kind of illustrating what's going on. And, and so on these, in this text here, I have some of these ideas. We can, you know, one option is to hold on to them longer, buy cheap ones and replace often. You said maybe we should do 70%. Um, and then we talked about buying high build quality and replacing some of them rarely. And you said, you said maybe 30% on that. So um, now I do want to interject here that this is just one example. And we do need to think through uh, you know, I'm hoping everyone on the, on the session this morning will think about how to extrapolate that into their own worlds. And maybe you don't have laptop yeah. decisions, but maybe you have other decisions to make. So right. keep that in mind. Right. So yeah, this is just meant to illustrate things. And, and here's, here's a spreadsheet that we might use to, to, to address this. Um, what I've got here is some data that I've gathered. And this is fake data that's in this spreadsheet, but it's, again, uh, for teaching purposes. Maybe, maybe we have some prices of that high-end laptop. And if we look forward over the next 300 weeks, I've got here a um, uh, you know, multi-year period. Maybe if we buy a high-end laptop a few years down the road, it's going to be cheaper. Instead of 1500 it might be $1,485. So, so one of the advantages, according to this data, of, of holding out is uh, machines get cheaper. And so, so that's something that kind of goes into the mix. Um, here's the failure rate. Maybe we've got some data from an industry body or from within our own organization. You know, what percentage of laptops are likely to fail? And as they get older and older, you can see this 0 0.2. Hey, Lorian. It's, it's kind of hard to follow all of this. Yeah, this is making yeah. my head explode. Can we do something better than this? 
I mean, I look at a spreadsheet like this and I just get tired. You know, how am I supposed to make sense out of this and what does the graph mean? And wow, that's amazing. And, you know, this is a toy example. If, if this was a real example, it, it gets, you know, obviously harder. And, and this is also very data intensive. We, we have to have all of this data before we can do anything. Um, guess what, guys? There is a better way. <laughs> so, so let me uh, pop out to a quick demo here. Um, so this is a, a decision model of the same thing. And what I'm going to do is not take you through all of the pieces here. I'm just going to kind of go through some representative parts, and then, uh, and then we'll run this, and we'll let it tell us what, <laughs> what, whether you were right or not <laughs> there, Margaret. So um, just to review this a little, it's, it looks kind of complex. There's a lot of pieces here, but really each piece is very, very simple to understand. So if we just look at one piece at a time, it'll be easier. So here's that curve, new high-end equipment cost. So uh, time is the x-axis here. So as, uh, as we choose to buy equipment later and later in time, the, the cost of that equipment is going to drop. It's going to fall off pretty rapidly. Here's that failure curve. This is the likelihood that a machine will fail. Well, really high build quality equipment you know, it's probably not going to fail, but, but, you know, it reaches a point where we really, you know, might not want to hold on to it much longer because its failure likelihood goes up. In contrast, here's the low-end failure rate. It starts kind of at a non-zero level, so these low build quality laptops, you know, some percentage of those might just be DOA, might work, not work straight out of the box, and then um, low-end equipment cost uh, might drop off at, at a slightly different rate. So the question is, and, and this is really the, the nugget in the center of this whole webinar. We've got all this data. We've got ideas about how all this works. Why aren't we letting computers put this all together for us? Why are we trying to do so much of this in our heads? Why are we looking at the numbers in our heads? We can go a substantial step further if we start to structure things in terms of a decision model. You know, these are really so, easy to move around and change. So, Lorian? Yes, what we talk about our outcome that we're after here? Because what oh, we're right. what we're talking about really is again, if we go back to the upending decision making webinar that we did earlier, start with the outcome. Let's look very clearly at those outcomes. Right, and when we design a decision model like this, we usually actually do start with the outcome. So thank you, Margaret, for asking that. The way I've put this together, and your situation might be might you know you might want to formulate this differently. The, we've said, what's the total annual cost per user of equipment? And that cost is going to be some combination of how much it costs to replace the laptop if it fails, as well as the maintenance cost of that equipment. And this is all just kind of some machinery to get that total annual cost uh, calculated, given the decisions that we've made. So these are our three levers. The high-end fraction, that's um, how many, it's what we talked about earlier. This is how many uh, expensive high-build quality laptops we have as opposed to low-build quality ones. High-end replacement lifetime is how many years are we going to hold on? What's our policy going to be for holding on to the, to the high-build quality laptops? And then, and then the low-quality laptops. Maybe we want to have a policy that we replace those every two years and the high end every five years or something like that. So the idea is that these are our levers. These curves represent our externals, things that we get by doing some analysis or getting some benchmark data from the industry. And then what we're doing is we're saying, how do these levers combine with the data in these curves in order to produce an annual cost? And if we had more time, guys, I mean, we could, you could totally understand this whole thing in about half an hour. It's not complex, and, and I think we'd, we'd start to really get all the details of how the formulas worked. But um, not going through the details of the formulas, here's the model in a, in a simulation mode in, in 3D. And let's do your thing. High-end fraction, what did you say? 30%. There's 30%. 30%. And then you said we'd hold on. We'd hold on to our low-end laptops for two years. So that would be about 100 weeks, which is about what I had here. How long should we hold on to our high-end laptops, Margaret? I think two years is the answer there, too. OK. So what this does is it, is it just does the math, right? And it says, 
The total annual cost, if you make those choices, is $713 per person. And that sounds pretty good. Um, but now we can run it backwards. This is the great part. So now we're going to tell it, instead of us picking the levers and then showing what the outcome is, I'm going to run it forwards. I'm going to run it backwards. And I'm going to have it go through a number of levers. Now in practice, of course, um, we, uh, you know, we wouldn't have a graphical user interface running because that slows things down. And we wouldn't be running it on my desktop computer that, I, that I'm using here today. We run this on very fast compute hardware and probably some special purpose stuff to do the optimization. But this is important, despite the fact that in practice we wouldn't do it here. Um, it's really important to be able to visualize this before you hand it off to that compute setup server. So what this is doing is it's just systematically trying all the different lever settings, right? And it is measuring that annual cost. So for each lever setting, it's picking one up. And it ends a new minimum, it's storing that in this bar. So what did you have? I think your number was 700 something, Margaret. I well, think it, it was. Found setting. Was it? So here's one that's, that's 481, something like that. So, um, so let me uh, stop this, and then we can look at what it decided. So it said 100% of our laptops should be the high-end ones. So it really disagreed with you. And we should hold on to those. So your, your two-year thing, oh no, four years, right? 200 weeks is four years. Mm -hmm. So we should hold on to our high-end laptops for a very long time. So given this data that's here in this model, and given how far we ran it, um, this is what it came up with. And you know, certainly we could, we could try more lever settings. But I, you know, the real point is, could we have come up with this policy of how long to hold on to laptops on our own? No. Um, do most people bother to use a computer to help with it, them with this? No, because it's just too hard to hire the statisticians and, and do all of that stuff. But we built this model in about three hours one day for purposes of this webinar. And yet, even though it's a kind of a toy model and there's maybe a few factors we'd like to include, it's useful in its own. And, and we've saved, gosh, you know, from the 700 you said down to the 400-ish that we were able, 480, you know, that's 300 bucks per user. You get a company of, of thousands and thousands of users, and you're talking a major cost savings from three hours on a little effort to, to formulate uh, you know, your equipment policy. And of course, we have way more than laptops in place. We have all kinds of equipment. So, so I mean, I think this is just tremendously exciting. And again, the point here is that we've reduced the cognitive friction and the effort that it takes to, to, to formulate a problem. And you know, I know there's a lot of boxes here, guys. No question. You've got to go through these one at a time. But it's not hard. And compared to the spreadsheet, it's, it's maintainable and it's visual, and people, multiple people can look at it and, and have discussions around it. So that's, that's really, you know, really the main point we're trying to get across today. Oh, that's a pretty picture. So, so um, I'll go back to, go ahead. So we have one way of doing the model, which is if we make these decisions, how do they ripple through into the future? Right. But I think you have another set here, which is now, if we want these outcomes, how does that ripple through into the present? And nice. that is incredibly powerful. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, thank you. That's kind of neat. So let's just wrap up here, and then uh, we'll give you guys a chance to ask some questions. Um, here's the other epiphany. This entire space, that whole multi-trillion dollar and human life-based uncharted territory, can be formulated as an optimization problem, which means basically once we know what our outcomes are, we can use a computer. And once, once we've you know, taken the trouble to build the decision model, we can then tell the computer to tell us what our levers should be. I mean, how amazing is that, that this entire space can be formulated in this, in this way? And uh, to me, this is just such a huge, huge opportunity. And, and this, this is why, you know, history of the future. Now, just to kind of make one last point, there's three types of optimization. What we've talked about today is to fix my external environment and then to say what my levers should be. So notice I didn't change all of those curves that I had that said how long the laptops will last and 
uh, what's their likelihood of failure after, after a particular amount of time. The way I ran it here is I said, for this fixed environment, assuming I'm right about that environment, what should my levers be? What should my decisions be? There's other ways of doing this, which is to say, look, here's two choices I might make. Here's two levers I might have. Let's try all the possible future environments. And this is often what Monte Carlo analysis does. Let's, let's kind of cycle through all sorts of scenarios, all sorts of external scenarios, and find the decisions that are really robust against um, a lot of changes. Or, or maybe anti-fragile. Maybe as things change in a random way, uh, we actually get better um, by making certain decisions. That's kind of another holy grail. Um, and then there's a third thing, of course, this is the hardest, is both your levers, both your decisions, as well as your external environment change. And so you're trying to find good decisions in this very fluid situation. No way could you do that in your head. So um, using computers is, is a good thing. So uh, with that, I will take some questions. And there's our holy grail. So we have a question that is, what is the probability to be greater than the optimal? Depends on the problem. Greater than the optimal. Let's say you mean, you mean uh, a greater number so we haven't hit the optimum. Completely depends on the problem. Let so me let just me interject. Um, if, if, if there's any clarification as she's answering the no. question, go ahead and put that into the question yeah. box. Yeah, I hope I'm answering the question that you asked because I think I know what you're saying. Um, it, so, some problems, if we, if we solve them by looking at all of the possible solutions, it would take the heat death of the universe, you know, millions of years to solve them. And so we have to make some shortcuts. We can use heuristics to structure the problem. We can guide uh, the computer by designing the, the decision model as well as giving it hints as to where the levers could be. Um, or we could use very, very fast uh, computers, very powerful back-end servers. So all kinds of things we can do to not have that be too likely. Um, obviously, the larger the problem, the more likely that is to occur. And there's you know, thousands of scientists out there who are experts at this. Um, and, and so there's some great, great ways of addressing that problem. And the follow-up to that, the idea is that we need to include the uncertainty uncertainty explicitly. Yeah, we do. And you know, I didn't show that side of it. Um, and, and let me, just, just so everybody knows what we're talking about, let's imagine we're not sure of the failure rate, the future failure rate of laptops, right? We don't, we don't have hard data there. It's going to be within some range. And I didn't show that, but you know, it's certainly part of what we do is we can say, look, our likelihood of a laptop, of a high-end laptop failing after two and a half years, um, it's, it's going to be you know, between 20% and 80%. It's going to be somewhere within a range, as opposed to knowing exactly what that likelihood is. So having those uncertainty ranges is certainly something that we can add to this and is, is you know, something that, that really helps in many circumstances. Another question, can your optimizer determine the policy from using laptop versus tablet in the next few years? Not the one I built in three hours, but if we sit down, give me a call, and we can sit down and we can extend this. It'll probably take us about half an hour to add that to it, and then we can run it and see what happens. How cool is that? That's pretty cool. So, <laughs> then, then <laughs> so the great thing about that is that this optimizer, if we want to call it that, can actually handle decisions of just about any type. And, and the way we get there is by being very, very clear about what the externals are, what the levers are, how these things relate to each other, so what are the dependencies, and how they eventually impact the outcome. And if you know how they impact the outcome going forward, then you can also find out how the the levers need to be set to create an outcome that you've set out there. So if you have an outcome that is, I want to raise my uh, profit from existing customers by 20% year over year, and you think you have some ideas about how to do that, well, now you can find out if I'm going to hit that number, what's it going to take on the backside? And the great thing about this, whether you're running it forwards, or you're running it as an optimizer, you can drive out specific initiatives that you need to achieve. So you're creating essentially a work list 
uh, if I'm going to do this, if I need to raise production by by 40% in order to do that, you'll have that. And you'll then be able to have a conversation about whether or not that's possible. And, and let me just, you know, kind of circle back and, and, and add to your excellent point, Margaret. Um, we're not saying this is perfect. What we are saying is it's much better because the thing you just talked about, in most organizations, people do that in their heads, invisibly, and they don't use computers to, to help them work through the, you know, the combinations and the spaghetti of all of those curves and how they all marry together. Really, really, most people in those use cases that are outside that core set of use cases kind of throw all the data away, throw computer support away, and just kind of look at charts and then try to make a decision after they pour through the data. And I know. Uh, so that's what the breakthrough is here. We are past time, so let's yes, wrap up let's quickly go. with contact okay. information. Whoops. And um, um, we you. will answer that question offline uh, to the person who just put another one in. Uh, to find out about our next events, always check engage.quintelli.com slash events. And if you have questions beyond the session, feel free to reach out to me. I'm, again, Margaret Johnson, mj at quintelia.com. And you can find more information, of course, on our YouTube channel, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We're everywhere. And we'd be glad to interact with you in any of those platforms. So with that, I think we will say thank you very much for joining us today. We very much appreciate it. And I see some additional questions coming in. We will answer those via email after the session. Have a great rest of your day, and thank you once again. Thanks, everyone.